So a company has been collecting data for some time now, and they decide to hire you. They want you to build a machine learning model to make some predictions. And you go in there, and starting on the first day, you take a look at the data, and you grab the last six months of data. Um, you make the decision of train your model using the first five months, and then leave the last month for testing your model. And everything is great and you spend some time building this model and at the end you realize that the model performs very very well on that training and validation sets however as soon as you test your model using the test data remember the last month that you used your model sucks what's going on here so this is a very, very common situation where you spend a long time training your model just to realize that it doesn't generalize well to the test set. Today, we're gonna be talking about a very, very clever technique that's gonna help you, number one, diagnose the problem, and number two, it will set you on the right track to fix it. Let's start. So we all know about overfitting, and there are one million ways to fix overfitting, to, you know, to deal with it. But there is something that many, many people miss in one of these situations where their model is not doing well on the test set. And is that maybe, just maybe, that test data is not coming from the same distribution than the training set. So what, what does that mean? I have here my iPad. We're gonna try to take a look at what I'm talking about. So let's say we get our data set and we split our data set in two, right? So we have a training set and then we have some of the data that we're leaving aside for our test set, right? So I'm going to make the assumption that we could visualize this data in two dimensions. So if I go here and I'm gonna try to plot my training set here, let's, let's make the assumption that this is what that training set will look like if we were to plot it in two dimensions. And now let's plot the test set. And let's assume that when we plot the test set, this is what we get. So this is the, this is the question that I have. Can we separate the test set from the training set if they will look like this, right? And the answer is obviously no. There is nothing here that tells us that these two sets are easily separable. But if I'm gonna go back and redraw that test set, imagine that if we drew the test set, this is what we get now. In this particular case, you can see that we can definitely create a model to split the training data from the test data. What this means is there are features on the training data that are pulling our training data to the left side of this chart. And there are other features that are pulling our test data to the right side of this chart. So these features here are making both of our sets different. Therefore, if we train a model on this training set, that model will learn to fit specific information that is not present on the test set. Um, the same thing applies at the time that we test our model on this test set we will expect features that are not there. We will expect information that is not there. So obviously the model is gonna start making some wacky predictions. This is a problem that's very common. Now, how could this happen? When I started this video, I gave you one example where, where you take six months worth of data and split that in five months for training and then one month for testing. So something that happens very commonly is that the world changes. Um, we don't realize that it changes. Like when COVID happened, for example, a bunch of the processes, a bunch of uh, the behavior of users completely changed at that time, causing many, many machine learning models to, to stop making good predictions. So it doesn't have to be as radical as COVID, but when something changes, the data is going to reflect that change. So maybe within that six month period, 
something changed in our data that's causing the last month to have characteristics that are different from the first five months. So this is just one example of how this could happen. But the bottom line is, if your training data is not coming from the same distribution as your testing data, you will see a model that underperforms as soon as you test it. So let me talk to you about adversarial validation. Fancy name, it sounds really, really complex, but it actually isn't. So adversarial validation will help us determine whether your training data and your test data are coming from the same distribution. This is how it works. So let's assume I have a data set that looks like this, right? I have uh, four different columns plus the target variable. And what we are going to do, the way adversarial validation works is that we're gonna mix together all of the data that we have. We're gonna put together the train data, right? With our test data. And then we are going to get rid of the old target variable. So whatever we are trying to predict, we don't care right now. Remember, we are focused on determining whether the training data comes from the same distribution as the test data. So we're gonna get rid of this target column. We don't care about it, we're gonna delete it. And we're gonna add a new target column. Call it adversarial validation target. You can call it potato, it really doesn't matter. The goal of this column is to set a value of one for every single sample coming from the training set and a value of zero from every single sample coming from the test set. Using this new data set, now you're gonna build a model. And this model has one goal. You want with this model to separate, or at least to try to separate the training samples from the test samples. If this model is successful, that means that there is a problem with the distribution of your data. If this model is capable of splitting training samples from test samples, that means your distributions are different. So how do we evaluate this model? To put together this model is a very, very simple binary classification model. You throw all of this data at it and you're gonna evaluate it using the ROC curve, right? The receiver operating characteristics, that's a mouthful curve, okay? So let's say we have this curve and this is the way it's gonna look like, right? And here you're gonna have the true positive rate of your model and the false positive rate of your model. And you know, this here means, okay, so this is the random chance, meaning a model that does randomly select samples from where they come from, it will perform at about this line. And then we are going to use the AUC, okay, the area under the curve to compute how this model is doing, to measure the performance of this second model, okay? So the idea here is very simple. If our true positive rate versus false positive rate, if it looks like this, the area under that curve will be close to 1.0. If we get an AUC close to 1.0, that means that our model is very good at telling whether a sample comes from the training set or whether it comes from the test set. So what does that mean? Well, if we get a high AUC, that means that we have a problem with the distribution of both of our sets. That means that there is something that's giving away where one sample is coming from. So we should take a look at those sets. Now, the opposite case is if our area under the curve or if our ROC curve is, you know, very close to this line here. So in that case, we will get an AUC close to 0.5, meaning our model is very close to randomly deciding, making a decision, right? Which means our model cannot tell training samples from test samples. That's a good thing. If our model cannot tell the samples apart, that means that both sets come from the same distribution. So that's great. So if your model is not doing well on the test set, 
is not because there are differences in the distribution from where they come from. That means that you have a different problem. But let's assume for one second that you do this, you create this new data set, you build a model, you run a prediction, and you get a high AUC. So the area under the curve is at or close to 1.0. So what do you do next? So now you know that the both data sets are not coming from the same distribution, but that's great. But what do you do with that information? Well, you have that model. The next step is for you to find out which features from the data are contributing to those predictions. So you can go and list every feature in order of importance to make one of those predictions. And what you're going to find out is that the most important features that are contributing to one of those predictions, those are the features that are leaking information to this model or leaking the status or the origin of one sample. The most important features will be the ones that you want to take a look at. To summarize, adversarial validation, it's a very, very clever technique that's gonna help you determine whether your training data is coming from the same distribution as your test data. If they are not coming from the same distribution, you should expect a gap between the performance of your model on the training set and the performance of your model on the test set. So keep in mind that whenever you're seeing that big gap, you may want to use adversarial validation to determine whether you have a problem with the distributions and start looking into which features you might need to work with in order to remove those differences. I hope this was helpful. So let me know in the comments if you have any questions and, and if you're looking for a different way, I like to call it a more fun way to learn and keep up with machine learning, take a look at binomial.com. The URL is gonna be down here where we write one machine learning question every single day for you to practice what you know. And if you make a mistake, we always have a detailed explanation letting you know what the right answer is and why we picked that as the right answer. And with that, I'll see you on the next one. Ciao. So let's say we have a data set, oops. I turned it off. It's not that easy to work with this iPad here. Okay.